says hello up there. So, uh, hello. Um, you know all this stuff now, so uh, I'll go straight. I'm a front-end developer at Liquid Light. Uh, I have been doing web stuff for about 14 years. And uh, I've been professional uh, for about seven, I think. Um, so, I mean, by professional, I just mean someone's been silly enough to pay me to do it. Uh, but anyway, uh, if ever you want to find me on anything, uh, I'm at Mike Street. Here we go. Uh, yeah, that includes stupid things, including Elo. Does anyone remember Elo? That sort of passed for about five minutes. Yes, thank you. Uh, the only thing I'm not Mike Street on is Pokemon uh, because I found a bot on GitHub. Look at this. Uh, that you run on your computer, it simulates walking, catching Pokemon for you. I thought I was being really clever, so I got an email from Pokemon to tell me they'd worked it out and they banned me for life. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not allowed to play Pokemon anymore under Mike Street. And if I can't do it under Mike Street, there's no point to do it. So, uh, I was going to talk to you about the digital bucket list of people with the web. The talk hasn't changed, but the title has because I hated it. Because it sort of sounded a little bit, you know, about my own house. So, uh, I sort of had a thought about what it could be, and I thought, oh yeah, this one's amazing. An unordered list for web folk and how to make yourself better. Still just didn't quite work. Still just sort of makes me sound a bit like I'm the best, but I'm not. Uh, so, I then had a look around Facebook, and I thought, you know, what kind of links do people click on? Everyone, everyone's clicked on these kind of links. Twelve things that every person in the web must do this weekend. <laughs> Number nine will blow your mind. Um, and then I sort of cried a little bit that I'd done that, and it was just no. Uh, so, while you're listening to me ramble on, you've got a little bit of a mission. Uh, I want you to sort of actually listen to what I'm saying, take on board, um, and we're going to try and find me uh, less up my own ass talk title. <laughs> so, while you're sitting there, listening to me, there you go, look at that girl, she's tweeting, she's loving life. Uh, I want you to tweet me a suggestion for a new talk title. Uh, with the hashtag Mike's Wanky Talk title. Um, <laughs> I will pick the best one over the break, and I do have a prize for whoever, who I, whoever I pick. Uh, if you see one that's great, feel free to like it, and I'll take the likes into consideration. So, let's, uh, let's get me a less wanky talk title, shall we? Anyway, what this talk is actually about, I know I've wasted some time talking about the talk, um, it's basically a, a list of things that have got me sort of where I am today. They're things I tend to do outside of work. They're things that I encourage every developer to do. I'm not saying you have to do these things. I'm not saying you have to do any of them, but I'm hoping that they're sort of, you'll walk away and feel inspired and be like, oh yeah, Mike's that great person who did that, so I'm gonna go home and do that as well. So uh, yeah, let's, let's begin. So the first one, build a CSS framework. Um, I think every front-end developer or developer who even does a little bit of CSS should build a CSS framework. Um, I'd like to point out this isn't my code. Uh, it's got some like vendor prefix in there. I don't know who does that anymore. Uh, I don't know who doesn't use variables. Uh, so this is just a stock image I found. Um, so whether it's a CSS framework, a SCSS framework, a less framework, a stylish framework, whatever you want to build it in, I think everyone should build one. And for those that have built one, I'm going to run through the steps that you should be familiar with. For those that haven't, this is what you should expect from building a free CSS framework. So, step one, you build it. Great. Step two, use it. It's awesome. Step three, use it again. It's rubbish. Doesn't work on a second site, so you have to delete it all. Um, then you sort of build it again and it's a bit better. And then you use it again and you realise you haven't used it a second time. And then you make it a bit better because you realise it's missing something, so you go back and use it. And then you sort of go back to six, use it again, make it a bit better. It's just, you know, eventually you sort of get somewhere. It's never actually finished the CSS framework. Everyone's always developing them. Developer everything. them. Uh, developing them, so just don't ever worry about it. And one thing about your CSS framework is that it's yours, and that it works for you, and it won't work for me. So please don't push it out on the web as the latest, greatest fr web framework, because I hate those things. And I got so angry about it, I wrote a blog post um, about it, so I'll put this, this link up afterwards, uh, so you can go off and read my rant uh, about how I somehow managed to tediously link CSS frameworks to sex. Uh, but anyway, um, <laughs> how does writing a CSS framework help? Uh, it gives you the experience of writing big site CSS. So if you write little sites, if you're a little freelancer and just do a small site, you don't really have that experience. You've never faced the problems of writing a big code base because you're always going to run into problems with writing a big one. So if you write a CSS framework, you start to realise that 
naming a box sidebar left on a two column page when there's no main content doesn't really help uh, in sort of you start to get a bit more modular with your CSS. Um, yeah, so go and write a CSS framework. Next one. Uh, I would like to point out these images are uh, the kind of images that you've always wanted to use in your web projects, but I've never been able to because they're so crap. Um, so here we go. Write a blog post about something you don't understand. Uh, I, don't, I think until you start writing about something you don't understand, you never really understand it um, in the way that if you're trying to justify someone, if you're teaching someone, whether it's through word or through action, it's really, it's until you do that do you really actually start to understand that topic because you sort of, you feel like you can't bullshit your way through it. There's someone going, well, why does that happen? And you'll be like, I don't know. So until you've written that blog post, it sort of really hammers home that point. So some examples, if you're struggling, uh, Flexbox, classic, uh, PHP includes, SCSS mixins, some Ruby, some Hamel, whatever that is anymore, uh, SVG, and even the background CSS property. So this one seems really basic, and you think everyone knows that, but this blog post is amazing, and it's got loads of things that I learned from it, despite the fact that I'm, I'm really good. Um, so <laughs> even, if you're, even if you're sort of starting out, and you think everyone will know that, then write a blog post anyway, because it will teach some idiot like me about something that I don't know. Uh, so, I mean, I've pretty much ruined this slide already, because uh, I've said it, but it expands your knowledge and it really hammers home the point. So, CSS framework, blog post, go. Next one, uh, put on an event or meetup. I hope this is what you look like upstairs um, <laughs> for the photographer. I hope you're all posing with your champagne glasses. Um, so, I sit at a desk all day, every day, and fortunately I don't have to talk to clients. Uh, if I do, it's just a little email going, it's fixed. Um, it's only until you start putting on an event or a meetup or something do you realise how much you have to actually talk to people, and it's horrible. Um, I mean, especially if you're putting on an event for charity, you get to sort of start bringing up people, you know, playing on the heartstrings, or going, oh, but it's for the children, and then, you know, you actually you hear them crying, and then you'll hug, and it's all great. Um, so, putting on, <laughs> putting on an event really does uh, force you to, to meet new people. Uh, you face new challenges, you'll never sort of have the problem of getting 40 people in a room when you're just writing CSS. Um, it kicks, it kicks your organisational skills into gear. Me and Candy printed out a calendar of this month when it got near to Bytes and we realised that it was only three weeks uh, when you're doing, and once you've crossed out the weekends and you've crossed out the days that you're actually out at meetings, you've actually got like three days to do everything. Um, so it really sort of sorts you out. Um, it gives you something else to focus on when you're uh, thinking about problems. You can step away and realise that you haven't sent that email reminding everyone to bring some money. Uh, and it forces you to talk to people, which I don't do every day. Uh, right, next one. Read some documentation. This is so boring. Um, but if ever you're sort of bored or got a spare few minutes, then pick your favourite framework or preprocessor or compiler or anything and just skim through the docs and see if anything catches your eye. So I did that a little while ago through the SCSS docs, something for this talk. I found this is Super Selector. I read the what it does like four times and I have no clue still. Um, all I noticed, this is all I noticed, is that when they list the function it's got an underscore, but when in the, in the demo it's got hyphens, I'm not sure what to use and I don't understand how that gets false in that history. But anyway, uh, I found that. The other one which I did find, which I did understand, was unique ID. So uh, SCSS, you can put in this unique ID function and it will return a random string, uh, which is great for cache breaking. So you've learned something, which is great. So, read it the docs. It, uh, it does make you a better developer because you find new ways to solve problems. If you had a cache breaker, you might have sort of been typing a string and having to remember to update that string every time, but you can now use unique ID. So reading the docs gives you new ways to solve old problems. So this next one, you're all going to cry when I tell you to go and do it. You should all go and make a HTML email uh, because uh, they're horrible. Um, although Gmail now does it for, for sport, uh, supports responsive, so yay. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> how does it help? It does make you realise where we've come from. When I started dabbling in the web in a short time ago, it was all tables and stuff, and now we're using flexbox and CSS grid layouts and stuff. I don't 
don't understand. And having to go back to building with tables and inline styles and what used to be font tags really makes you go, wow, you know, I'm lucky that the web has progressed so quickly. The other thing is you have the same problems that you have on the web, except you have to solve it with just pure HTML and basic CSS. Some uh, clients only support padding, uh, some clients only support margin, some clients support padding and margin, some clients support margin, but only if you declare it independently as each left. And it's just, it's only once you've sort of gone into that hell do you come out the other side and make all your websites better and neater and nicer because you appreciate what you have. Next one, contribute or make an open source project. I think we're, uh, you know, we're too busy taking from the web that we should sort of give back a little bit. And it doesn't have to be amazing. It doesn't have to be the latest, greatest CSS framework. It could just be something so simple, a little bit of JavaScript, a little function that you use every day. Just put it up on GitHub and people will love it. If you don't want to make a new open source project, then I encourage you to go and contribute. Go to, go to GitHub and just have a search. Come look at your favorite frameworks and things and just look through the issues. You can raise an issue if you notice a problem. Even that counts as contributing because it's pointing out something that hasn't been pointed out before. You could suggest new ideas, you can suggest patches, you can make a pull request. And this pull request is sometimes feared, I feel, in the sort of web community. Everyone's like, oh, pull request. But it's not. It's so good and so, it's so easy. And I think everyone should go and at least do one pull request. Uh, there is this uh, initiative here, yourfirstpr.github.io, which they sort of aim to try and sort of encourage people to do their first pull request. And people could send them their sort of more simpler tasks just to try and get people in the sort of Git and, you know, open source ecosystem. Um, there's, if, you, if you did want to sort of contribute but you don't know what, look at documentation. Developers are crap at documentation and they hate writing it. So if you want to just go and sort of write some nice little messages so that the next person that comes along can sort of easily enjoy the tool, then go and do it. If you did want to make something, I've got a really cool list of some ideas that you can do. Um, there's a jQuery plugin, an NPM module, some reusable code like a map plugin, a Bower package, if Bower's even still around, uh, a composer package, um, or anything, really. Uh, it's not helpful list at all. Uh, but if you didn't know what a jQuery plugin, an NPM module is, a Bower package is, a composer package, then go and write a blog post about it um, and learn. So how does contributing to open source help. It sort of, you give back to the community. Well, if you put some code up, someone will make a pull request eventually improving your code. And that way is sort of a new way of learning. You can sort of go, oh yeah, that's a better way of doing it. And then when you face that problem again later down the line, you can be like, oh yeah, Jack told me how I could solve that. That was really easy. Um, which actually happened on my very first jQuery plugin that I put up on GitHub. Someone made a pull request which pretty much rewrote the whole thing. Um, but it's now better. Uh, and I know that it's better and I've sort of learned from that. And even if there's one person who raises an issue or you know there's one person that you don't know uses your code, then what's, what's a better feeling than that? The next one is a bit random, you might think. Uh, you should go do some DIY. Uh, this is my colleague and friend here, Will, is the uh, guy in the corner here. Uh, we stepped away from our desk for a day, uh, earlier on in the year, uh, to make a sort of device lab for our office. So where are all our phones and tablets that we do loads of testing all day, every day on? Um, it sits in the corner, they just sort of sat on a MacBook box that I'd hacked together, which wasn't very nice. So we decided to buy some wood and uh, build a proper device lab. So uh, here it is. Um, this is the back of it. This isn't it finished. This is it in progress. <laughs> Uh, there's some holes here for cables, uh, there's a cup of tea here, most importantly. Um, but that's how it pretty much started. Um, then we're all really concentrated on spray painting <laughs> this uh, device lab here. This is just some primer before we put paint on. And it now sits proudly in the corner of our office. Um, yeah! Uh, these are some Lego boards. Uh, we came up with this really modular design, so we've got some Lego boards so we can move the Lego around. So we've got a few more devices since that picture was taken. But um, it's sort of, you know, if we want to get rid of this iPad 1 
um, you can and put on a new device and change the Lego around to make it all better. And the thing that's amazing about it is it sort of sits in the corner of our office and you know we come in and we see it and I sit there proudly that the fact that my digital hands made something physical. Uh, clients come in, we even have one client come in and take photos of it uh, so it can show back at its head office about, oh look, what, look at the agency we hired, look how good they are. Uh, you can also see our laser cut and liquid light logo in the middle there because uh, I like laser cutters. Um, so how, do, how does DIY help you become a better web developer? It doesn't really, but it gets you away from the screen. It gives you a project that's not on your computer. And it gives you something physical to build and hold and be proud of and show your mum. You know, you know, look um, so yeah, go and do some DIY. There's probably, probably some DIY at home that you've got to do, but that doesn't count. Uh, it's got to be new DIY. Uh, sort of carrying on from the physical thing, uh, everyone should go and buy an Arduino and pick up an LED and make it blink. You could buy a fake Arduino for like £10 on Amazon, um, which I've got loads of, and it's just, it's amazing that you write some code and then you watch this little box and it lights up and sometimes you can make it beep or sometimes you can make it crawl across the floor. And it's just sort of that whole getting code from your computer onto something physical to physically do something is just, it's great, really. And um, everyone should do it. And the reason you should is because it sort of helps you understand machine code just a little bit more. Because with an Arduino, you have two, two functions. You have a setup and a loop. And the setup runs when it turns on, and then the loop runs forever until you turn it off. And when you've only got those two functions to play with, you have to really mangle some code to get it to do stuff. And it just, yeah, makes it wonderful. And when you get that compiling error of you've sort of clicked upload and then it fails and you don't know, it's sort of more problems to solve with. It's sort of like Python-like code, so you might learn yourself, teach yourself some Python as well. Why uh, next one, which uh, Dan touched on lightly, is everyone should buy a Raspberry Pi. Uh, not this kind of Raspberry Pi, the proper kind of Raspberry Pi. Um, they're £35 for the sort of basic one, or you can get a Pi Zero for a fiver, uh, which you should all go and buy. They're you know, really small, really easy to lose. Uh, I think I've got about four or five. I only know where one of them is. Um, so if you find one, it's mine. Uh, so you can, put, you can put anything on it. You can make it into a media centre, you can make it into a web server, you can make it into a VPN server, you can make it into a, a robot that does stuff and cleans your house. Uh, you can even, if you wanted to do, put Windows 10 on it. Um, so when you are using, when you get your first Raspberry Pi and you get it home, there's a few steps that you go through. I think everyone goes through this. Um, and just to let you know what yourself into. So you go out and buy it, and you get home and install Raspberry, and you set it all up, and it's really nice. And then you uh, download your first script off the internet, and everyone's like, run this, run this. And then you realize that it breaks your Raspberry Pi, so you have to reinstall everything and set everything up. And then you know not to run that script, you just ran. Uh, and then you probably install Node, I think everyone installs Node. Um, and then you just repeat that. So. Just keep going until you're bored of it, but it's great. And it gives you a, a safe place to try stuff. It gives you a safe place to run some code. Um, have you ever wondered if you go into a web server and you run like rm star slash, what happens? Do it on a Raspberry Pi. You'll, uh, you'll love it. Um, or you can practice your rsync. Or just if you've got a script that you don't want to run on your computer, then run it on the Raspberry Pi. If it breaks it, you know not to run it on your computer. But if it doesn't, great. Right, the next one. Uh, do something pointless with the web. Uh, before I carry on, I was looking for an image that signifies pointless, and I think nothing more than a smoky looking lady with a slice of bread uh, defines, defines pointless. It was a tough, it was a tough call between her and this man who <laughs> really loves pizza. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't even know what this ad's doing. Why is he wearing a Christmas hat? Anyway, uh, so do something pointless with the web. Make it dance, just make it sing, just build something that doesn't have a purpose and build something that you've always wanted to build, you can't get money from it, no one else will want to use it, but why not? I mean, some ideas that, you know, in case you're sort of thinking what could do. 
uh, a shoe tracker app. So you go home, take photos of all your shoes. When you're in the shoe shop, you can take another photo and it'll go, oh, you've got a pair just like this, or not, go ahead, buy it. <laughs> Pointless. Uh, a web app that tells you what TV to watch based on your Twitter search. So sort of look through Twitter and see what people are tweeting about, you know, Great British Bake Off, Port Hollywood Bones. And, you know, the more people tweet about it, the bigger it gets until you have to sort of go home and watch like a whole series or something in the evening. It's pointless. Uh, an app that looks at a supermarket website and tells you where to get the cheapest salmon. Um, you just type it in on oh, salmon, it goes off, scrapes all the other, you know, uh, supermarket websites and tells you, oh, Lidl's got it for half price at the moment, or go to Sainsbury's, it's better. Uh, you could make a web-based lava lamp. You could tell I wrote this list sitting on my desk. Uh, we've got a lava lamp sitting on my desk. Uh, or a photo booth style app. So you take a photo and similar to the, uh, I hasten to say it's pointless. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, 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 how does it help? Um, it gives you, new t gives you a chance to sort of play with some new technologies, new methodologies, new tools, new processes. Just It gives you a chance to just play with something that you wouldn't normally do in your day-to-day -day job. So... Basically, what this whole talk has been about is make sure you have a side project. Um, you need to just like, I think it's important that you step away from the web world and just do something that you enjoy but can sort of further your career, I suppose. So whether it is picking up an Arduino, making it blink, writing a CSS framework, or contributing to open source, look at that. Um, I think everyone should have a side project. Gmail was a side project of a Google employee. He sort of wrote it on one of their hack days and then took it to his employees and said, oh, I've sort of written an email thing. And they were like, yeah, great, we'll take it. Uh, YouTube was written by a couple of guys in just a shed, I think, and now they're sort of just bathing in money. Um, but this is a little rule I like to tell myself. Uh, if you're paid to do it, i.e. if a client has come to you and paid you to do it, it doesn't count as a side project, it's a job. Uh, but, if you make money from your side project, if you get an income, then that's a great side project. And uh, I think just whatever you do, even if you do just make an Arduino blink, it's, you're all awesome. <laughs> he's, he's cool. So, uh, thank you very much. Let's uh, see if we can find me a, a talk title. <laughs>